Namaste, this is uh, Rishikesh Writings and uh, we bring you the guest and yoga teachers from Rishikesh. So today our guest is Praveen Nayarji and he is a yoga teacher from Malaysia. He is teaching yoga and sharing a yoga wisdom in Rishikesh. He teaches many schools in Rishikesh and uh, today we explore his journey of yoga in a life and how the yoga transform him in this human birth. Namaste, Praveen Ji. Namaste. Praveen Ji, how's your yoga journey started? When was the first you heard, heard the word yoga? Very early. Um, I was born and bred in Malaysia and my parents have Indian roots and they're from Kerala. At least my grandparents are from Kerala. And uh, my parents were having a lot of uh, interest in spirituality. We used to have a lot of kirtans every Thursdays in our house. So that vasana, that imprint, went into this little child growing up in that environment. Um, I'm definite I would have heard the, the word yoga and that just resonates and I think at the right time it found uh, itself germinate when it came to the right exposure that this body had at that moment. So I think definitely I had heard the word yoga in a very young age uh, from my parents and and I, I think I found it as a practice. Yeah. So who's your first uh, yoga guru or yoga teacher from whom you uh, learn it? Start in an asana. Mm. I think um, if I have to define yoga as the practice of asanas, uh, I found it uh, first actually from my friend. Um, I began my journey with this, uh, with this body in terms of exploring body and movement and the health of the body when I was very much interested in dance, which I am still very much interested in the movement of the body. And one of my dance friends, um, her name is Haru, and she introduced me to yoga way back in 1998 um, in Chennai. So she introduced me to the Shivananda style of yoga, and that brought me further and deeper into the asana and pranayama aspect of yoga. But before that, definitely my parents were my teachers. They introduced me or gave me the template or the manual of yoga being something of a spiritual practice about Dehi and not the Deha. And of course I went into the practice of Deha and then I found the Dehi. It was about the indweller and not about the body. So my first teachers were definitely in the Shivananda style and then I moved on into Iyengar yoga and then after that I found my own breath and rhythm in expressing my life and my version of what yoga is to me so that I can now realize that I am the Dehi. Indweller. Like we say, uh, every individual human being have a soul, a spirit, which is which run the whole whole molecular body molecular body system and energy body system. And same way, yoga uh, key point is breath. But when you see when we see a Shivananda style of yoga, Iyengar style of yoga, some people go to uh, Vinyasa Vinyasa flow, uh, many uh, variation comes up. So what's the difference you found it? by practicing these uh, uh, point of yoga? I definitely realized that the emphasis that each style of yoga had given the world is from the aspect of where did they see yoga or where did they experience yoga from for Shivananda. It was a very holistic approach of yoga, establishing of course the Advaita lineage where Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya that you are Brahman and you're experiencing this world as body, mind and complexes. So that was the light in where they were teaching yoga to come back to the Dehi. But in other forms of yoga you have more of refinement of the body or refinement of the breath or could be a refinement of um, chanting and different experiences. But I find at the end of the day it's various sadhanas in order to come back to who you are, to remove this sense of that I am incomplete or to seek for completeness in that which is incomplete, to, to realize that I am Atma. 
So these are the various sadhanas. But one requires jnana to know that it's about the dehi and not about the body. You can begin from the body, li experience, but you need to know that you are first not the body but the dweller of the body. Yeah. Like when we say a magnet, magnet have a south pole and a north pole. Mm -hmm. And in the music we have a, a Indian Hindustani classical music, Indian mm -hmm. classical music and a Karnataka classical music. Mm -hmm. So is there also uh, some somehow little similarity or a differentiation in uh, the learning a yoga in uh, the south part of India and learning a yoga in a northern part of India? Hmm. Yes, I have exposure of that definitely. Um, geographically, it is very much different in terms of um, food, it's very much different and also the interaction with the teachers is different uh, from the north. I think when I'm going to compare, I'm comparing where I learned yoga first in Kerala and then where then I moved to Rishikesh and also explored yoga with my one of my early teachers which her name is the late Karen O'Bannon. So Rishikesh has a different environment. It was, it is and it was in fact very spiritual in the early years. Now it has a different dynamics. Um, it is what it is now. And in the south, uh, it was more of a Gurukul environment or an ashram environment that I learned yoga from. So that was different. We had a, a schedule from morning to evening and we lived all together and having the Guru Sishya Parampara um, relationship and responsibility uh, whereas in Rishikesh it's slightly different you're just visiting your teacher and coming and then you could visit various teachers there is a uh, plus and minus to all of that yeah so what are the minuses you found it? <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a Gurukul system you're living with your teacher yeah. so you see your teacher and the teacher is uh, living by example and there's a lot of servitude towards the teacher and you are kept in an environment where that environment is also conducive to your practice whereas if you're outside and just visiting so that journey from outside to the teacher space there's a lot possible distractions where if um, a mind is habituated to get distracted might get distracted so it's not about how many teachers you learned from or what are the techniques that you're learning but what how are you going to approach yoga uh, with what you have? So that idea from, comes from Niyama, Santosha, to be content with what you have. Otherwise, you are constantly looking for various informations that possibly can also direct you to one source, but can also possibly take you away from that because you are now hoarding. You're adding a lot of information now. And uh, you teach us about the body movement. What are the body movement and would you like to share about it? And uh, why this is body movement is important in a yoga? I believe that it's a previous vasana that I have because from a very young age, I loved dancing. I love music and that made, gave me a lot of life to feel the sense of living in this body. And that took me to India, exploring various Indian classical dances like Odyssey and Bhadanatyam. And from there I found yoga. But when I found yoga, I found dance as in celebration of various movements and various directions. But when I found yoga, I found yoga quite sagittal, quite linear, like uh, rigid and also in one, one direction. I didn't, that didn't matter so much. But as I went into the format of Iyengar Yoga or the experience given to me about Iyengar Yoga at that point was um, uh, quite line based or uh, picture based or aesthetic based, how it looked like but not based on how it felt like for me. So I felt um, from there I had a transition, a realization that this didn't feel right for me. At that moment, after some time, of course, it had given me a lot of experience. And then I moved on uh, to bring that dance into this vocabulary of asanas. And now I have found movement. And as a human body, I think we all want to move. We are not made to put pose if we want to get somewhere with our life we need to move and what are the inborn functions of the body to move to, 
to relive life so that until at least you kick the bucket you are able to to transact in this world yeah, yeah. you also do a therapy uh, during your sessions uh, to uh, many uh-huh. patients uh, <laughs> and uh, you say what what is your view about the allopathy and the yogic therapy i think i have a lot of patience rather than i have patience yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i've learned to be very patient and i know that i have a choice to be patient patient with people who are coming to me yeah. but i found out that i should not separate my yoga from therapy the way that i teach yoga should be therapeutic i should not hurt a body or take the body to a tipping point or a point of danger where the body does not require that much of bend or that much of twist or the contortionism the breed of contortionism in yoga has become unbearable when you look at the way that people show yoga as to be body i understand that you start from the body but it doesn't end there and if we are going to inspire people by constantly reminding them of the body then it's never going to be therapeutic so i find that yoga should be thought in a therapeutic way so how do i teach yoga in a therapeutic way is to find out the kshetra the field in where i'm going to apply this technique of yoga can it take these movements does it require this movements and whether it needs this kind of movements or can it do these movements that supposedly is yoga so then it becomes therapeutic when you apply something in a space where it requires it and it can do it and it can be a part of your our life then it becomes therapeutic so there's no need of a therapy class yoga in itself should be practiced yeah. in a therapeutic way uh you, we see like uh, when someone is start teaching a new newly newly learning the yoga path and they teaching the students sometimes uh the student get injuries and things what is your uh, what is your advice to those teacher for uh, through your uh, through your wisdom like uh, many <laughs> come for you first they says okay they would like to do a 200 hour yoga teacher training in 300 hour they go it and the teacher says you have to stretch your body but sometime what happen that uh, student get a uh, spine pain or a knee injury and things so what is your advice is uh, what what are the point or what are the um, the thought they should uh, take during the practices like when they are teaching the student there's something in me trying to answer this question in the simplest way possible um i don't know how will this sound but i'm going to say it that it's prarabdha actually we all come with certain amount of baggage to this life into this life and you experience life with those baggages and those baggages are going to supply us some kind of path and during that path there's going to be pain and pleasure and if we're going to hold on to uh certain pains and pleasure uh know it as an experience so for me i'm looking at all of that as prarabdha but of course intentionally one should not hurt anyone in their life but there are certain things that life is going to teach you and certain uh sips of it are going to be sweet and pleasurable and certain sips of it are going to be bitter and difficult so i'm learning it to i le- i'm learning all of this to know that it's an experience that this dehi this person in dweller is going through and um i'm trying to make sure that i'm not hurting anyone by checking that person before giving them that information that i may have as a teacher whether they require it in their life maybe they may need it in certain parts of their life and they need to move on thereafter so the ability to see the relevance nourish them and also allow them to transit uh you say first you check check the check the identity of person and then how do you check is there any particular devices or is there any particular uh, a parameter to check it the soma the body right yeah. we are speaking we are um we are energy we are bio emotions we are not bio mechanics only although we feel that we are bio mechanics but we are bio emotions and we are soma so by being just by sitting beside someone even in the bus or tube you can feel the presence of that person right and also the eye contact their expression the body language you can know someone and of course a teacher and student relationship requires time so of course from that 
like a student may come for a 200 hour teachers training course and I can understand them some students I can understand them the first day after a week and some students it may take some time but what I'm telling myself is they're here for a journey and they should know that I'm also a part of their journey and it's a journey and I'm there just to assist them to pass and they're also there to assist me pass through my journey we're not holding on to each other we're there to show each other that we are one and the same only maybe having different dialogues right so yep that's it <laughs> I don't know if I answered that question <laughs> yeah so how about the family life your family live in uh, Malaysia or your family in um, India a biologic fam biological family my my mom lives in Malaysia I have three sisters and family they all live in Malaysia I'm here but I also believe that my extended family is my yoga family my teachers my students the spirit in and the things that I love is all my family yeah so every 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 student have a very hard teacher in a life and every student have a very good teacher in a class so what is your who's your hard teacher and who's your uh, a good teacher like uh, who motivate you to do more better improvement in this in the, in the subject which you're learning in the life. I think the most compassionate teacher that I found is my own spirit yeah. and the most terse and difficult teacher was also my spirit and I, I learned that very recently in my life that I have a choice to sit and see to sit where I'm sitting and to look at the world from where I am I have a choice in how I view my life so I think I could be the most difficult person to myself as a teacher and I could be also the most compassionate person to myself of course there are so many teachers uh, that had inspired me to find Vairagya in my life. One of them is, of course, Bhagavan Ramana Maharishi and Nisargadatta Maharaj. Um, those are th they inspire me. But I what, think which thought uh, they inspire, like Ramana Maharishi thought, and uh, what are the thought of uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj? Because well, they they have book uh, I am that I am from the Nisargadatta Maharaj, which is quite popular mm -hmm. around the world. Yeah. And uh, Maharishi. Um, who am I? Who am I? Yeah. Yeah. So Bhagavan Ramana Maharishi's view, yeah, the conditioned word in the English language, um, is that first realize that you are Brahman. Nisargadatta Maharaj's view is whatever you are experiencing is Brahman. So one is step one, I am Brahman, and the other one is step two, is to see the world as Brahman also. So that had inspired me to find divinity within myself, which was not too difficult, but now to apply that to see everything, nothing but the appearance of that one divinity, which is indivisible. Yeah. One thing that inspired me a lot by Ramana Marishi is don't get into anyone else's business. <laughs> <laughs> Mind your own business. Yeah. <laughs> and you used to be a student of B.K. Sayangar. Yes. And yeah. what, what is your favorite moment with the, him uh, during the teaching or the, in life? Uh, uh, I was first a student of Karen O'Bannon for, for, for a long period of time actually. And she introduced me to the, the Iyengar family. I had very short experiences with them. Uh, I had um, yeah sweet and sour relationships with my teachers like with Karen O'Bannon uh, my relationship was she was an, a kingmaker a nurturing person and she helped me find the ground underneath my feet and one thing that the Iyengar family inspired me is that um, practice the, the dedication towards the practice is what that inspired me I think I carry a lot of that from that family um, and they are, they are students and the teacher and the style, the dedication towards the practice. 
but we have to be careful how much we are dedicated because if you forget the sight of the dehi and only go towards the direction of the deha then you're going to be having this tug of war so we have to be careful about that yeah and you also <laughs> <laughs> i'm not <laughs> yeah so basically uh, like in a yoga uh, we uh, Uh, we see there is the one part is physical aspect one is divinity part so what mm. what is the student should take it like uh, which uh, little bit little glimpse where the student can take mm, i'm going to say from my experience i was gifted to know the manual of spirituality first the aim of spirituality first and then come to the practices but what is given to the world uh, i'm generalizing is they are coming to the practice first and then knowing the goal either way it's important to know the goal of yoga as in yoga sutra we have chitta vritti nirodha to quieten the fluctuations in the mind or to unidentify oneself with the mind otherwise uh, the thoughts you get consumed by the thoughts and you think that you are the thoughts so it's very important for you to know the manual before applying because otherwise you're going to go into this circus acrobatic um, reel of constantly creating this acrobats not knowing that you are already this divinity and you just have to discover this divinity through the various layers of experiences yeah and what is your best moment in rishikesh and oh. why this place attract you I think it's I I definitely think it's sitting by the Ganga in the early mornings and around 5:15 I generally go for a walk an hour walk and I just sit by Bhairaj where I live right now the Ganga there and just even uh, when I used to live in Tapon before I used to come down here and sit by the Ganga in the early mornings that was the sweetest time I experienced that sweetness where I could just uh go into this quietness yeah and what are your view about uh, the yoga schools which is pop up in rishikesh it is what it is yeah because in any kind of civilization there's going to be this up moment and then this down moment and it's like a life of any hero so rishikesh is heroing now it's going up 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 and then of course there's going to be this downfall of all of that so it's a part of up and down there's no right or wrong about it there's just yeah. a consequence right if you have this many buildings just built without any proper infrastructure so close to each other it is accommodating to the need but there's going to be consequence right how much change you saw since 2000 you coming yeah and now 2023 is running up oh, wow so many changes you value and did you also find any a good uh, spiritual person in rishikesh mm. with whom you can recommend the people or you can say okay you should visit if you are coming to rishikesh and talk to that person just for uh, your spiritual seeking mm one personality living in the body previously was dandi swami okay. i um, loved his presence um i had spoken to him very very short conversations and then i realized that it was not about communicating it's just being in his presence um gave me a lot of quiescence in my mind and of course this uh, this All, all if you talk about all the four vedas yeah. ever running now is ganga so i think she if there's anyone that you're seeking for that is ever fresh and glorious and is going to sing to you the the story of this vaidika sampradaya is ganga to just sit by her and listen to her and even to speak to ganga take a dip in her and meditate in her presence ganga ji and uh ashram the fact that i'm thinking so long <laughs> <laughs> every ashram has its plus point okay. yeah the 
the older ashrams like Kailas Ashram, of course, if you want to study something serious in the Advaita Sampradaya. Mm, and then you have uh, Vaishnava Ashrams or Shaiva Ashrams and various. And I think it's about your prarabdha, what kind of baggage you're coming for and where are you going to keep that baggage and what resonates with you. You're going to find these various ashrams. And I found many ashrams resonating or who had helped me grow up to be who I am or what I'm experiencing right now. Yeah. So what is a breaking point in the life? Where you you thought that you found it, you break and then you come up from that break. Oh wow, that was a few years ago. I think um, when I was practicing um, in Corona, we're all confined, right, in in, in in our own apartments or houses, and and I was practicing a lot at that time. I thought, oh wow, this is the opportunity for me to practice and and recreate. But then I suddenly felt. Why am I feeling so heavy and, and, and literally, if I can use the word depressed? So I had time to practice and then realize it was the mat, the yoga mat that I'm standing in, created this, this rectangular square that limited me. And one finally I said, no, I'm not going to stand on this mat and practice. And the moment I removed the mat and I started moving and creating, I started creating and I found a new person. With the grammar that I already had in terms of asana and pranayamas, I started recreating and then I realized I have a choice. I'm not stuck to anything. I just, I have a choice to rearrange my life and, and at that point it resonated to me and it might resonate to certain people and it might not. So that, that was my breaking point. I'm, I'm, I'm not stuck anywhere. I have a choice to move on. It's because possibly we feel stuck is because we are holding on to something. Yeah some amount of vairagya <laughs> yeah it was nice to speak with you oh thank you so much and uh, thank you for sharing your wisdom mm. and uh, at last uh, my question is what book you would recommend to a student of yoga oh to read it if you ask me this 15 years ago yeah. i had different list of book okay. but now <laughs> now it, it's been what yeah maybe 20 years now that I'm teaching and, and practicing yoga now the book that resonates with me is uh, a book called Mahamudra and it might not resonate with young yoga practitioners because they're still looking for a form to recommend to the student of yoga who can start their mm. basic journey and then come to a a big yoga teacher journey. Wow, we have to really define what's basic because people who come to the practice, what is basic for me would, would not be basic for someone else. But if they're looking for um, understanding um, the manual of yoga, the sutra, uh, shastra, I think uh, books of Dhyananda Ashram uh, or Ramana Ashram uh, Swami Chinmayananda's books, these are books that are going to introduce to them how valuable um, Shastra is. Um, and if they're coming to the asana practice, there are various books. And one of my, uh, I, I love her books, is uh, the book of, uh, in, um, of yoga, is of Donna Fari. She has various books which um, has a very calm systematic approach towards the body when you're applying asanas and pranayama to it but now when i see my life right now there was one book which i bought 15 or maybe 10 years ago i don't know why i picked up that book but now when i look at that book it's like wow this is what i feel and this is how i feel is mahamudra the way of balance by uh, will john johnson i think yeah that book resonates a lot now that i have some amount of maturity in terms of experiencing what I'm experiencing with yoga and its value that it's given to my life. Yeah. How about the David Frawley? Dr. David Frawley is a, an amazing scholar and he's written various books in a very scholarly manner and of course I have great uh, respect for his books, definitely. I think, yes, that's going to bring a lot of value to, to anyone's uh, yoga experience. Yeah. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Jay.